Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our digital service. And maybe most importantly, today, happy Father's Day. Uh, dads, I hope that you've spent the morning getting showered with presents and accolades of your greatness as a father. Um, I'm going to spend my morning with this beautiful girl who's the reason that I am a father, AKA giving my wife a much deserved break. Um, parenting has been a pretty different world for a lot of people I know over the past few months, turning into homeschool parents overnight. Props to you guys who are hanging in there and fighting the good fight. We love you dads and we think you're doing a great job. Ava, can you say happy Father's Day? Happy, how do you say happy Father's Day? Okay, you can say happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. That's expectation versus reality right there. All right, let's go for a run. Come on. You want to spin? First of all, I want to say a big thank you to all the staff for all of their hard work during this challenging time. And also a thank you to the video team for all of their hard work on making these videos for all of us to continue to worship together when we can't be together physically. We met as a board on Monday and we started the conversation on how to open the church back up in light of the new Saskatchewan provincial regulations that came out a few days ago. This will take some time to figure out and implement and church will certainly not look like we were used to. But the staff is working to figure out ways we can worship together corporately once again. Our verse today is Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I grew up in a Christian home, but I was not a Christian until my wife and I had spent a year in New Zealand after I was done vet school. We were both baptized in New Zealand and not long after that baptism, I remember I was at a conference on the South Island of New Zealand and I wrestled for the first time with the questions brought up by this verse. I was reading Romans for the first time and I struggled with the questions brought up by verses in Romans such as Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And Romans 6.15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. And 6.23, for the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And 6.28, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Works versus grace, how good is good enough? I believe this is what this verse is addressing. Jesus, speaking as though he is one of the people, says, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? How good is good enough to get into heaven? Earlier in the same verse, Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. The verse I think of most as I ponder the question of works versus grace is this one, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are saved by grace, but prepared in advance by God to do good works. In Andy Stanley's book, How Good is Good Enough, Andy says, the reason the Bible doesn't give us a list of behaviors, if kept, will guarantee us a spot in heaven is because all 44 authors of scripture understood that mankind needs a savior, a messiah, not a to-do list. This is the uniquely beautiful thing about the Christian faith that separates it from all other faiths. This is the struggle of all Christians and what I have wrestled with since I read Romans for the first time as a Christian 20 years ago. 
Last week, Doug talked about how he grew up in a home where he was encouraged to question everything. I had a professor in vet school, and his name was Otto Radisitz, and he wrote a text on large animal veterinary medicine that ironically had the nickname, The Bible. This was because it was the main textbook used worldwide for large animal medicine. And his main focus was to always question everything. If you gave an answer in class, he would say, well, Trent, why do you think that? And then you started to sweat. Why did I think that? And you better come up with a better answer than just because I do. It's important in our Christian walks to always question. And I think that this verse is encouraging us to do just that. Always question yourself. Am I on the right path? The narrow road that leads to life? Doing the will of our Father in heaven, following Jesus with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind? Now we will have a time of worship. Thank you as well so much to our worship team for all of their hard work during this time. And then after that, Ryan, We'll delve deeper into this passage.
Well, this is it. I don't like it, but this is my last week preaching in our series, Jesus' Greatest Tweets, where we've been walking through Jesus' epic Sermon on the Mount, pulling out these intense truth lines that he's been dropping for us. It's been such an incredible journey getting to walk through this with you guys uh, and diving deeper into Jesus' teachings here. I hope it's been helpful and meaningful for you as well. It's crazy to think that we started this way back when we were meeting physically here at the church, and now we are uh, finishing off totally digitally but I've still really enjoyed it and I hope you have too. A lot of these lines that Jesus has been dropping through this sermon are pretty intense and this week is no exception. If you read in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. That's a pretty intense line. And we're gonna come back and dissect that a little bit in a bit. But first I wanna start by asking you a question. I want you to think and try to add up and calculate how many times in your life you think you have clicked on a box or on a button that says, I have read and agree to the terms and conditions without reading any or maybe more than even like two or three words of the document. For myself, I've been using an iPhone for probably almost a decade. Not the same one, they definitely don't last that long. And every time I get a new device or update the software, or they update their terms or whatever, this document pops up on my screen and says, have you read and do you agree to these terms and conditions? And I always say, oh yeah, for sure, without reading a single word. I mean, for just the number of times I've told Apple that I agree with their terms and conditions, I could probably be considered a pathological liar. That's not including all the other apps and services and devices that I use where I just say, oh yeah, I totally agree. Essentially, I'm using a bunch of digital devices and services that I claim that I agree with and I have no idea what they're actually about. Now, I don't want to compare Jesus' teachings to like a boring document about terms and conditions and privacy policy and all that. But I think there's kind of a parallel for what Jesus is teaching here this week. See, so over the last four weeks, I had said that Jesus is kind of delineating what it means to be a true follower of him, to really embrace the message that he's preached throughout the contents of this sermon. And he ends with these four weeks drawing these kind of uh, parallels and distinctions. In the first week, it was the difference between uh, two different types of roads or gates. The next week was about two different kinds of prophets, one's bearing good fruit and one's bearing bad fruit. The next week, it's going to be about a true foundation and a false foundation. And this week, what's going on is Jesus is talking about true and false disciples. And when he talks about this, what he's really referring to is people who have said, yeah, like I agree, I'm in, but they really have no idea what it means to be a follower of Jesus. They've just claimed to be a part of this thing, but really don't know what it means. But on the other hand, there are people who have understood what Jesus is actually calling them to, what it means to love God and be in relationship with him. And they've clicked, yes, I agree to that. And they are in. So let's get back to the text. Again, Jesus says, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's a pretty unnerving line, but it actually kind of gets worse. Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. This is heavy stuff. Over these final four weeks, essentially what Jesus is asking people is, are you in or are you out? Are you all in or are you all out? He's saying, you can't be on team Jesus and on another team. And I mean, this makes sense. If you've played a games or sports or, or anything like that in life, you know that you can't be on two different teams at the same time. You're either on team Jesus or you're not. Pre-COVID, I'd play basketball on Sunday nights with a bunch of guys and I was also in a ball hockey league. And I couldn't just show up to my games on a night and be like, okay, tonight I've decided I'm just gonna play on both teams. Um, that would be confusing and wouldn't work and wouldn't make sense, but it would also be really unfair uh, because usually there's only one team so disadvantaged to have me on their team, but now there are all of a sudden be two teams that are at a total loss because they have to deal with Ryan on their team. Oh, Jesus makes it very clear. He says, you're either in or you're out. You're either team Jesus or you're not. You're for me or you're against me. And he takes this point further this week with some pretty intense language talking about either being able to enter the kingdom of heaven or not. Now, before we dive into kind of the application of the text, I want to dig through a little bit of theology that we can find here. So first of all, I want to look at verse 22. Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then Jesus continues on. He says, I'm going to respond by saying, no, you, you didn't. I never knew you away from me. So question is, when Jesus starts off, he says, 
Many will say to me on that day, well, what is that day? You know, Jesus drops this line. It's easy for us to read by, past that, but it's important for us to understand kind of theologically what's going on there. When Jesus says that day, well, what's he talking about? So if you read through scripture, you get a picture of a God who works through a massive grand narrative throughout all of human history. I think it's easy for us to adopt this mentality of a God who shows up in different moments. You read a Bible story and you're like, oh, God kind of showed up and did this. And then in his other story, it's kind of episodes spread out. But that's really not what's going on. God is writing a narrative that spans all of human history and it's drenched in his love. You see, at the very beginning of human history, God acts out creatively. He begins speaking and he speaks people into existence. He creates them in his image out of his great and incredible love. But those people, they go on to rebel and to choose sin and selfishness and to turn away from God and to continually run away from him. And God, out of his great love again, reaches out with reconciliation and eventually leading to the point where he puts on human flesh, steps off his throne in heaven and comes down to earth to give his life on the cross. But it doesn't end there. A lot of times I think our theology is that that's kind of where it ends. Jesus died and that's kind of it. There's this final act that we're supposed to look forward to as followers of Jesus. And that is that one day Jesus, out of his great love, will return again. He came for reconciliation. Now he's coming for total and final restoration where he's going to make everything new and everything right. There's a lot of teaching about this in scripture. One of my favorite passages in scripture is in Matthew 25, where Jesus teaches about this using three different parables. And he defines what that day is going to look like when he returns. And he's going to bring total restoration out of his great love. He's going to come and he's going to bring judgment to judge between the righteous and the unrighteous. Out of his holiness, he's going to distinguish between those things. In one of his parables, he actually says that kind of like how a farmer would separate his sheep from his goats, Jesus is going to separate people between his followers and people who chose to not follow him. And for those who followed him, there's going to be his great and incredible reward. But for those who didn't, quite the opposite. It's a pretty unnerving and daunting idea. And that's what these last four weeks are about. They're looking forward to that day, that final day of judgment where God, Jesus is going to restore everything. And he calls us to understand what that day is going to look like. He's going to evaluate us, say, did you in your life choose the narrow road or the broad road? Did you listen to false prophets or true prophets? Did you listen to those who bear good fruit or bad fruit? Next week, did you choose to build your life on a true foundation found in the teachings of Jesus Christ? Or did you reject that? And this week, did you do the will of God as is shown in Matthew 7, 21? Were you a true disciple or a self-deceived disciple? So we'll come back to that, some of those ideas about doing God's will in a little bit, but I want to deal with one more theological thing that's going on here. And it's a little bit more confusing. It's a little bit more murky. Again, in Matthew 7, 22, Jesus says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? At this point, I'm like, wait, what the heck? People who weren't followers of Jesus were prophesying and driving out demons and performing miracles. What's going on with that? For those of you who don't maybe know what those terms mean, to prophesy means to have the ability, the supernatural ability to speak on behalf of God. To drive out demons means to assume authority over the supernatural and spiritual forces. And to work miracles means to actually transcend the, the natural order of things, to overrule the natural and to perform supernatural tasks. So how is that possible for people to be doing that if they're not in relationship with God? Jesus says that he's going to say to those people who are doing those things, get away from me. I never knew you. Well, how is that even possible? It's a great question. And unfortunately, different commentators and scholars have really different ideas on what this means. Some would suggest that God allows some people, even though they're not following him or in relationship with him, to do these incredible and supernatural tasks and feats. Some commentators would say, actually, these people are doing these tasks, these feats are doing them by a different spiritual or a different supernatural force other than God, a dark or an evil source. And yet others would say they're not actually doing supernatural tasks. They're deceived themselves or they're deceiving others by the appearance of great accomplishments that aren't actually supernatural. Now, I'm not here to settle that debate today, but what we can know for sure from this teaching is that no matter how great and how incredible and how outstanding your task is, even if it's supernatural, it is not enough by your works and your tasks and your accomplishments alone to be considered to be part of Team Jesus. You're not part of Team Jesus based on what you've done, 
You're, you're part of Team Jesus based on what Jesus has done. And, and by embracing that, this isn't enough to gain you uh, acceptance or entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does gain that for you? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 21. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus says this is only based on surrendering to his will, not focusing on your own great accomplishments. And the cool thing about doing God's will is that it isn't like some crazy complex contract with political and legal jargon written throughout it, like most terms and conditions. Yeah, the Bible's long, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There are parts of it that are pretty hard to read. If you've read Leviticus and Numbers, you can uh, resonate with me on that. But really what Jesus calls us to, what God's will is, is put in pretty simple terms in Scripture. If you've been coming to FBC for a while, you probably know that our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And you probably know that we base that on the idea of four things, to think big, to think small, to think in, and to think out. And the last of those two things, thinking in and thinking out, um, those talk about kind of how we relate to God and how we relate to others. So thinking in, we invite people to engage personally with God. And with thinking out, we invite people to engage with the world around them. So we say, this is a great opportunity for you to engage in relationship with God and out of that relationship, bring others into that as well. And we didn't just kind of come up with this randomly and pick some words and some ideas. This is actually built on some of the, a really famous teaching by Jesus. Later on in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40, what's going on is Jesus is asked by someone, what's the greatest commandment that we need to follow? And Jesus responds by saying this. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And he says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. When Jesus says that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, what he's essentially saying is all the scripture that had been written up to that point, all hangs on these two ideas of loving God radically and loving others in the same way, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Although the New Testament hadn't been written at this point, I would say it's safe to say that Jesus would still say, all of this depends on these two ideas of loving God radically and loving others in the same way. And this makes sense, because if you remember in the big narrative earlier that I drew about God creating and reconciling and eventually restoring everything, it's drenched in his love. It's all an act of his love. So Jesus is essentially calling us in to do God's will. He's inviting us into this narrative that God's been written. It's a really cool invitation to say, come on, come do my will, participate in this. Let me continue to write my story through your life. These are simple terms and conditions, yet they're pretty complex and difficult. And the reason why is because we so often deceive ourselves. Just in the same way in Matthew 7, 22, these people deceive themselves. Maybe you notice that they have this refrain of saying, of, of saying, Jesus, we did this in your name. We performed miracles, we cast out demons, and we prophesied And all of them. He says, we did that in your name, in your name, in your name. And Jesus says, no, you didn't. It's so easy for us to deceive ourselves. And one of the big ways that we do that is we focus on the great accomplishments we've done, or we take this, we say, oh yeah, love, love, love. And we look at the areas where we're doing really well, yet neglect our areas of weakness. And we let those be just kind of justified or colored over by the things that we're doing well. Like I volunteer here, or I serve there, or I give there, or I'm kind to these people. So, you know, kind of mask that. If you were going to look at a car that you were thinking about buying and you showed up and the person selling it to you says, oh yeah, the body's in great shape, it's got a brand new paint job, it's got nice tires, ball and rims, you'd be like, oh, that looks cool. But then if you looked under the hood and the engine was destroyed, the motor had blown up, the battery was gone, it was just a disaster under there, you would never buy that vehicle. So often though, I think that's how we look at our lives. We say, well, Jesus, in your name, I'm doing these great things. And it's so easy to deceive yourself when you look at your great accomplishments rather than remembering to simply surrender to what Jesus has already accomplished for us. It's easy to kind of slip into this mentality where we cl simply click, yes, I've read and agreed to the terms and conditions without really engaging with what it means to truly do God's will, to allow his invitation into his love and his narrative to consume our whole lives. This is a complete and total call to surrender. I don't know if you noticed, but Jesus said, love God with all your heart, 
all your soul, all your mind. It wasn't like, hey, love God with some of it and the other areas that aren't doing well, don't worry, that's justified by the good areas. He's saying all of it, surrender all of it. Begin to evaluate the areas where you're struggling and surrender those to him. So often there are many of us that kind of have kind of clicked through the terms and conditions and have made up our own idea of what it means to follow Jesus. And this is really disastrous. And I want to focus on a, a couple ways that this can really create disaster and trouble in our lives. And I want to do that by looking at two metaphors that scripture uses. So first of all, followers of Jesus are described collectively as this thing called the church in scripture. And metaphorically, that church is called the bride of Christ. We're actually Jesus's bride collectively. Now, that invitation into a marriage-like relationship with Jesus is the greatest call to intimacy we could ever have. That is the closest relationship that we could have with someone. And I mean, that's kind of uh, expressed on a wedding day. If you've been to a wedding where, or you've gotten married where, you know, the vows are like till death do us part in sickness and in health, whether we're rich or we're poor, no matter what, I'm committed and I'm in and all of my life is yours. I mean, imagine if you're sitting at a wedding and the pastor's like reading out the vows, like till death do you part, all those things. And he turns to one of the people getting married and said, uh, you know, do you accept these vows? Are you in on that? And the person kind of like looks and they pull out their earbud. They're like, oh uh, yeah, sure. Like I'm in, whatever. <laughs> You'd be sitting there thinking, this marriage is headed for disaster. And unfortunately, we so often break the relationship that we have with God and we set it up for disaster and we set it up for failure and eventually for Jesus saying, no, no, I never knew you. you weren't doing that in my name because we've checked out and we haven't understood what it means to actually be engaged in that kind of a relationship. And speaking of that relationship, that's one of the things that's so cool about scripture. Maybe you get lazy with this, but this is an incredible way that God speaks to us. He shares his heart, his spirit, his love with us directly when he speaks to us. And he invites us back. He says, spend time praying, spend time with me, communicating with me, get to know me so that you can do my will. Again, it's that invitation, it's that narrative. Yet so often we just say, chirp, I agree. And we pass by it. And it creates a lot of problems for us. Another metaphor that scripture uses to describe followers of Jesus is being ambassadors of Christ. Scripture calls each of us an ambassador for God. We're actually the ones who represent him here on earth. Ambassadors are people that represent like a brand or a country or an organization to someone else. And, and they go to people who maybe don't know that much and, and, and say, this is kind of what we're up to. Those ambassadors are people who carry the weight and the understanding and the knowledge of what their organization, who they're representing is all about. They're people who are well in tune and acquainted with what, what they're representing. And they, this one person represents the whole of the organization or the country or whoever to the people that they're communicating to. You can't have an ambassador who doesn't know anything about what they're representing. But again, that's so often what we do where we just say, oh, sure, Jesus sounds cool, narrow road, whatever. I'm in, I agree to the terms and conditions. And we don't actually invest into what that means. We don't analyze how that would play out in our lives. And the unfortunate reality, and this might sound harsh, but no matter what you think, you're representing Jesus to the rest of the world. And when you do it like that, again, not to be harsh, but you're giving him a bad name. And not only him, but the church and the rest of us as followers of Jesus. You're showing people who Jesus is through your actions. When you take on that name of Jesus, when you say, well, in the name of Jesus, I'm doing this. When you're living your life like that, you give him a bad name. And this isn't to sound condemning or mean, but it's actually an invitation. If that's where you're at, this is an invitation. I'm saying stop, come and accept and embrace the teaching of Jesus here and begin to submit and surrender your life to the will of God and participate in his radical love here on this planet. So your homework this week isn't to go home and log into your Netflix account or Google Play accounts or whatever online services you have, Club Penguin, whatever, and make sure that you've read all the terms and conditions and understand what you're agreeing to. Now, I don't, you could do that, but I'd invite you to join me in just blindly clicking through those for the rest of your life. Your homework this week is to join me in asking ourselves, am I really surrendered to the will of God? Am I looking at what I've done or am I really surrendered to who he is? Am I embracing this invitation to participate in his will and be part of his narrative of love here on earth? And I'd invite you yourself this week to ask yourself this question. Am I enamored by what I've accomplished or am I surrendered to what Jesus has accomplished? Am I just so excited about the great works I've done? Maybe you're like these people who say, I've done miracles, I've driven out demons, I've done all these things. Stop 
focusing on what you've done because when you focus on your own accomplishments, you deceive yourself and you focus on what you've done rather than understanding that Jesus' invitation into God's will is one of grace. You can't do enough good things, supernatural or not, to save yourself. You can't do enough, you can't perform enough works to be good enough. This is an invitation by grace. So as you ask yourself this question this week, I hope you step back from being excited about what you've done and just surrender more to what Jesus has already accomplished. Pick up this book, read it, and say, Jesus, show me what it means to actually truly be your follower. Read Matthew 22, 37 to 40 and begin to evaluate your life and your weak areas as well and say, have I taken on this mantle of love that, that embodies God's will here on earth? At the end of your life, on that day, all of your accomplishments, everything you've done won't matter. The only thing that will matter is whether you've decided to surrender to God's will or not. Let me pray for you guys. Jesus, thank you so much for this powerful invitation. It's a daunting question to think about where we're at in surrendering to your will, but it's one that we need to process as your followers, God. I ask that as a community of followers of you, as a community of faith, that you would help us be people who take on this idea of radically expressing your love and powerfully performing and taking part in your will. Thank you that you invite us into your narrative, into your story here on earth. And I ask that you would help FBC be a place that does that really well for the world around us. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us for another digital service. Uh, remember that we are always praying for you guys and we're here for you guys if you ever want to get in touch and hit us up. And just a reminder too, to remember that there are youth and FBC Kids resources available on our website and app so that hopefully you're participating with that with your kids and your students at home. Anyways, have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday.